Welcome to the Autism and Neurodiversity Podcast. We're here to bring you helpful information from leading experts and give you effective tools and support. I'm Jason Grigla, a licensed counselor and founder of Techie for Life, a specialized mentoring program for neurodiverse young adults. And I'm Debbie Grigla, a certified life coach. And maybe most importantly, we're also parents to our own atypical young adults. Hello and welcome. This is Jason and you are listening to the Autism and Neurodiversity podcast. And I'm going to talk today and present the first of two parts broken up into the first being a discussion today about whether or not to get a diagnosis or look for a a psyche valve, have a psyche valve and look for a diagnosis to understand why we are managing, dealing with, and having issues, and some of the issues surrounding getting a diagnosis or a psyche valve. Um, we've had other presenters on about how to get a good psyche valve and why to get one, but I, I want to talk about it in more depth about the pros and the cons. And the second part in my next episode will be focused on a discussion that I would have with somebody who has recently found out that they are diagnosed with autism or neurodiversity in general, or a neurodivergent um, brain type, and what I would say to them and what I would want them to hear and what I would want them to know. So that will be next time. And so I I want to start off by just saying that I'm, I'm speaking from a therapist and a parent, not having gone through being diagnosed with autism or something similar, but I have been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder and it was no surprise to me. It was no big deal. It was no issue. It was just like, well, yeah. So what does that change? And, and in reality, I think that's pretty accurate. (laughs) Getting a diagnosis doesn't fix anything, but it can definitely help. And that's what I want to talk about today. So if you or a loved one is considering um, getting an evaluation, I, the first thing I want you to look at are your motives. If someone is desperate to be diagnosed because they want a reason um, to make sense, if they want their life to make sense, then they're kind of looking for a solution that isn't really a solution. It could be helpful and it can be a relief, and we'll talk more about that. And then someone who is passionately against getting Uh, an evaluation or a diagnosis also has some issues typically around shame, embarrassment, judgment, um, ignorance, and parents as well struggle sometimes wanting to have an assessment done um, for their children. And um, just right off the bat, I would say after years of experience and working with this population that the pros of getting a diagnosis outweigh the cons by far, not just a little bit, um, but it's an emotional process, an understanding process. And so in the beginning, sometimes it's hard to see those benefits. And that's some of the things that I would like to talk about um, now. So first, what's a diagnosis? A diagnosis is simply a way to classify things by similarities, traits, patterns, Everyone who is blonde is diagnosed blonde. If you want to be specific about what a diagnosis is, it's just a way to say, yep, she's blonde, he's brunette, they're a redhead. It doesn't mean anything except for what it is. It's just a description to use similarities to put things in patterns so that we can understand them better. And with with a pattern comes pros and cons. You know, if we have blonde jokes, or if we say that redheads are crazy, or whatever it is that's a cliche, or might even be based in some truth, but gets generalized, then yeah, then people say, well, the diagnosis is a problem because it just puts people in a box and nobody wants to be labeled. And so does, you know, does a diagnosis put us in a box? Yeah, absolutely. It says you meet the criteria for this description and that's all it is what we do with it is a totally different question so does it mean we're stuck in that box yeah sometimes it 
Like I, I'm never going to break six feet tall, but Jason, you don't know that, you know, you're still alive. You still could grow. The reality is I'm almost 50. I've been five foot nine and a half for the last 15 or 20 years. Before that, I was actually 5'10". I've shrunk a little. So the chances of me hitting six foot is rare or even impossible. So what? It is what it is. Now, you can say, well, that's not a, a good comparison to something like a neurodivergent diagnosis because that means people are going to be diagnosed with a disability. Well, that's something I want to talk about as well. Um, brains are different. A different brain means neurodivergent. A disability means that there are issues and things that make it harder for someone to function based on society's norms, and they call those a disability. Now, if everyone was blind, it wouldn't be a disability. But since someone um, is blind and the majority of, of the population isn't, then they are at a disadvantage. So when someone falls outside of what we call the bell curve, one or two deviations, standard deviations, you know, a third in the middle and, and one and two thirds on the sides. If you're on the outsides of that bell curve, you're going to have differences that will, for no other reason, make it hard except for the fact that everyone else does it different and you are the outlier. That is a huge part of a disability is always about comparison. So one of the questions people say is, I, I don't want to get a diagnosis because that will limit them or people around them will limit them or the world will limit them, especially if we get a, a diagnosis of autism, they won't ever be able to maybe be a police officer or maybe um, be able to go into the military or the FBI. And the majority of the majority of people that I work with, that's the least of their concerns. You know, having three or four possible career paths out of the literally hundreds of thousands out there being taken away. That's kind of silly. Now, if someone wants to be diagnosed as autistic because they think it will give them an out, they're, they're sorely mistaken. It doesn't work that way. Um, nobody gets a pass. Life is hard enough as it is. The other thing about diagnoses is that as humans, we compare our very small differences and create labels and boxes that sound like we are completely different. Like if someone's autistic, that sets them so far apart from the rest of us that it's a big deal and a big problem. And that is so stupid. We are way more similar than dissimilar. We are way more um, struggling with the same things than, than not. Um, life is the same for almost all of us, just in different ways. We all have our hardships. We all have our trials. We all have choice. We all have agency. There's nothing fair about life. So, you know, what What a diagnosis doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that it has to certify your future. It doesn't tell you who you're going to be. Um, but I'm never going to reach six foot and I'm never going to be a mathematician because my mind just doesn't work that way. Well, that's fine. I've got lots of other things I can do. Uh, maybe when I was young, if I had a dream of being a mathematician or if the whole world were mathematicians and I just wanted to fit in and I couldn't be a mathematician, that would be hard. So, you know, we, we point out small differences. I remember living in China, my wife who has dark brown hair was considered blonde in China because she was lighter than everyone else who had black hair. And so to them, a dark brown was so obviously different than the Chinese hair that to them, she was blonde. And that's just a great example of how it's just perspective and the perspective is silly. Most of the time, human perspectives are based in, you know, culture and human ignorance, naivety, that sort of thing. So being blonde isn't necessarily good or bad. What you think is blonde can change from person to person. What you think might be a disability um, is largely in society's head or our heads as individuals. The other thing is, if we don't have differences or we, we refuse to look at differences, I think we're in trouble. We're going to be at a disadvantage. If my teenage daughter is asked out by a guy who dresses and acts in a way that makes me assume that he's a jerk, that he might be dangerous, disrespectful, take advantage, 
have I judged a book by its cover or have I simply taken the information he gave me and, and tried to fit it into an understanding based on the very limited information I have? And I would say to my daughter, you know, I, I have some concerns. I don't want you to judge him and that it's not judging him. What I'm asking you to do is assessment. Use your brain, use your gut and say, I want to assess the situation or who this person is. That's different than passing judgment. I want to know what's really going on um, so that I can make the best of a situation. I might, you know, I might say, if you're going to go out with him, go with a group the first time or bring him over and let me get a feel for him so that my anxiety can go down. I could be wrong, but most of the time our initial assessments are right on and that's okay. So don't judge people, but doing assessment is always wise. It's different than judgment. Judgment means you've come to a final conclusion. You've judged their character. Um, you've passed judgment, which is none of our business for other people. It doesn't even work on ourselves very well. So does a diagnosis of a neurodiversity change us? No. Um, unless we have fears about it, we make it mean something that it doesn't mean, except for our own personal beliefs and cultures. Lots of children in China are placed for adoption because of a of human frailty and weakness and culture. And if those things are in the way of getting an assessment, then you will actually grow out of them and develop and mature out of those issues and the benefits will quickly outweigh the negatives. So as I said, anyone who's desperate to get a diagnosis is probably trying to be manipulative and that's not real healthy. Um, anyone that's desperate to avoid it, especially as a parent who doesn't want their child to be um, scarred or labeled or put in a box that's usually our own fears as parents and I don't blame I don't blame anyone for that I'm not judging anyone for that and it's a hindrance and a roadblock to honest assessment good information which is necessary to make good decisions about how to help and influence people a goodie psyche eval it can give a really good general map of the things that you will struggle with and the things that work and that don't and and why we struggle that is so important for the layers of struggle that someone who has um, some neurodiversity that's causing issues has, and, and it can help with insight. So that that is immensely helpful to know why I do something. And, you know, if you're refusing to get assessment or information or perspective about something that's causing you problems, then it kind of reminds me of somebody who's going to cross a dangerous jungle and refuses to take a map that other people who have been through the jungle um, have made with notes and insights into how to stay safe against the pitfalls and the dangers. And, you know, if we say, no, I don't think I need your maps and your experiences. I don't want to be stuck or held back by, you know, your boxes. My path is going to be my own. I'm not going to live in anyone else's shadow. Your prejudices will probably just rub off on me. And, you know, I'm going to be fine. And, you know, just because you died trying to cross a river with prana doesn't mean that I will. And it just goes on and on and on. It's kind of silly to say, well, I'm, I'm going to go it alone because my life has been hard and I have to prove myself. And if I get some type of an assessment or diagnosis that explains what and why and how to do things, somehow that that's giving in, giving up, taking the easy route, it's just silly. Parents, if you're afraid of getting an evaluation because it will cement a disability and you don't want them labeled, all I can say is, um, I get your concern. I had it as well. I don't want to dive into anything. You know, I, I didn't want to dive into anything that once it's out there, I won't be able to get it back. It will change their lives forever. You know, some of the fears are people will change the interactions if my child is labeled. So if you're already in a place where an evaluation is being discussed, it's probably already past time to get an evaluation. Now, there's once in a while a busybody that wants to come in and, and they're the know-it-all and they're sticking their nose into your lives and they're throwing around good opinions and they want to be helpful, but they really just want to be nosy. And they say, yeah, your child is clearly this and you need to get them assessed. But if it comes up once or twice by people that you trust and you care about, Ignoring it causes harm. If you know that there's going to be big problems ahead and you refuse 
to prepare for them, then it's like a stitch in time saves nine. And the pain and the suffering and the damage and the long-term problems are just more. It's hard enough being different. It's way harder thinking that you aren't different and that you should be the same as everyone else and you can't. So the pros of knowing, they are they far outweigh the negatives of knowing if you fit a diagnosis. And I know a lot of parents who push, push, push for a diagnosis because they're afraid for their child without it. And then I know a lot of parents who push, push, push not to get diagnoses because they're afraid. And you know, either one feels a little bit extreme. Um, I've seen some parents want a diagnosis because their child was hard and they wanted a reason and a rationale to make themselves feel better for their, their shame, their fear, uh, the judgment people put on them because their child is different. I mean, it's hard being a parent of a child who is difficult. Um, and then I've, I've seen children who could desperately benefit from a different approach and early intervention whose parents refuse to, quote, treat them any different, unquote, out of love and concern for their child, uh, which I think is silly. If they were diagnosed with diabetes, would you say, no, nope, they're going to tough it out and we're going to love them through it and, and they're going to end up fine. It's just silly. One of the things that I've seen and heard from young adults oh, past 20 who were diagnosed late, they they often say things like, I feel a sense of relief, a sense of understanding and insight now that gives me uh, some calmness, some understanding, some completeness, and it makes so much sense, and it takes away my crazy because I've been feeling crazy for years that everyone else knew something that I didn't and that I was just broken because I couldn't. They say it's nice to finally understand why I am the way I am, and it's certainly not going to change the fact that I'm going to work really hard and try to be um, healthy, independent, a good person. It's just that now I know how to approach it in a way that's effective and use my energy in areas that work versus areas that are a waste of time. Um, I, I don't have to beat myself up now that I understand the way my brain works. They say things like, if only I'd known it was okay to be different, it would have saved me so much pain. I thought I had to be typical and I killed myself trying to fit in. I, I just knew I was a round peg and everyone else was round pegs with round holes in life. And I was just going to force myself into them. And man, it broke me a lot. Uh, my relationship with myself has been pretty bad for years because I thought I was broken and I didn't understand. Um, I've been fighting with my parents and, and those who care about me for years, eventually because I've let them down or I've, I'm so ashamed or I have to protect myself from their, their quote unquote loving unquote expectations that they wouldn't let me settle, even though I was never going to be typical or fit into the boxes of what a typical box looks like. So I push them away or I've always felt ashamed. Um, I've lost relationships, especially with myself, but also others. I know I, I had to push a lot of people away to survive. I was hurting, confused, angry. I was, I, I had so much damage in my life because I didn't understand why I was different. Um, maybe I quit because I couldn't. And then I quit in everything instead of just in the ways that I knew I should have known. I wish I would have known that I, I wasn't going to be capable of. But there were so many other things I could have done if I had just understood. I, I hated myself because I couldn't. It's not that I wouldn't do it. I tried and tried and tried, but I couldn't. But I had to assume, like everyone said, that if I just worked harder, if I tried harder, if I just didn't quit, that eventually things would come that will never come because my brain does not do that. I think everyone assumed I was just lazy. I just didn't try hard enough. I, I could have avoided so much pain. It's such a common statement. Um, a lot of times it's the dads who are afraid to get evaluations because they want so much for their child and it's hard to watch their child struggle. Um, to the dads, I would say, love and accept your child for who they actually are, not who they say they are, not who they wish they were, because I don't necessarily trust teenagers or, or children's opinions or assessments about themselves. But from what I've seen, 
this is who they are and they're a good kid who really tries good person who really tries and they just can't well then assume that it's that they can't not that they won't because addressing it from a place of they just won't or they just try harder sends such a destructive message and sometimes teenagers are just lazy and they just need a kick in the butt i'm fine with that that's why honest assessment requires some good perspective and practice the other thing i would say is if you want your child to struggle less give them all the information they have and don't let fears and insecurities get in the way of getting an evaluation i like the approach of ruling out a neurodiverse diagnosis before jumping into any mental health approaches the typical approaches like parenting approaches that would be typical for a typical child which would be a little more pressure a little more consequence a little more teaching a little more goal setting a little more encouragement more suggestions and you know those would be normal parenting things but when you're asking someone to breathe underwater but they're not a fish it really doesn't help so I'm, I'm coming from a place of having been a therapist for over 20 years a juvenile probation officer a scoutmaster like a light a lifelong mentor of teens and young adults and i love that that's my career i would say having all the info you can as soon as possible is definitely the way to go get a good psyche though don't let it mean anything it doesn't make sure there aren't any unhealthy issues pushing an assessment or avoiding an assessment your approach into it is just one of this is it is what it is uh, there's no emotion about it, no judgment. You're just sitting with it. And I want to talk for a second about disability versus neurodivergent. Neurodivergent means their brain works different. And if disability means that they are at a disadvantage, I would say, yeah, most neurodivergents are disabled because they're at a disadvantage. A lot of that comes from where they have weaknesses as opposed to all strengths or balanced out strengths. Another issue of the fact that neurodivergency is a disability is, like I mentioned earlier, that because you are outside of the typical expectation, then you're not going to match the timeline for development. You're not going to match the performative expectations of um, what society thinks someone who is a good person um, should and could be able to do. So yeah, in those in those terms, they may really need an IEP in high school. And an IEP does not mean you're stupid. As a matter of fact, a learning disability by definition cannot be low intelligence across the board. It has to be spikes um, of of learning disability surrounded by normal to high intelligence. It has to be disparity between some of the things you do and other things that you don't do. Now, if someone is just across the board, um, low intelligence, low IQ, that's not, that it is a disability on itself, but it's not neurodivergent. Um, it's just different. That is, that is a different kind of disability and it is physiological in the brain, um, but that's a problem. ADHD, not necessarily a problem. Um, autism, not necessarily a problem. They do come with their own, strengths and weaknesses and their own issues for example because of the the square peg in a round whole world situation they're way more likely to have anxiety or because they care too much they might have more anxiety or because they don't know how to manage social emotional issues they might have more anxiety and therefore depression so you know i think with a neurodivergent diagnosis comes a higher likelihood of some mental health issues that could absolutely be avoided or minimized if not completely mitigated if we understood the way that their brain works and once i realized that my ocd is not um not a disability but just something to manage i've been good i actually use my ocd to help me manage my anxiety when my ocd ocd flares up i know i'm over uh, overdoing it i know i'm running too fast and i'll i'll not make it to the finish line before I, I you know i peter out i think assessment is always a good idea and when we look at hundreds of thousands of people who came before who were different enough that they really struggled in life and therefore had anxiety depression failure pain suffering differences 
we want to learn from them. We want to know what did you learn looking back that has worked for you and didn't work for you. So getting a diagnosis is, is always a good idea if it's a good assessment. And if you're not fishing to make a diagnosis happen where it doesn't really fit, or if you're fishing to avoid a, a diagnosis that, that actually does fit. Having said all that, if there's enough differences with you or your loved ones, get an evaluation, get an assessment, don't wait. And on the next episode, I'm going to talk about what I would say if you were a 20 to 25 year old who just found out that they were diagnosed with high function autism or ADD or ADHD. And I'm going to tell you the things that I would want you to hear and know now that you've been diagnosed. So thanks for listening. And I will visit with you very shortly. And I hope you're having a great day. I love neurodiversity. It is not a problem. It is not a diagnosis that's going to cause um, long-term problems. But the lack of information, if you do have a different type of brain, that's going to cause problems. So we always look to maximize success and minimize damage in our lives. That is the same with all of us. There's no differences in the fact that we are all humans having a human existence. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Autism and Neurodiversity with Jason and Debbie. If you want to learn more about our work, come visit us at jasondebbie.com. That's J-A-S-O-N-D-E-B-B-I-E.com. dot